Hello, my name is Natalie Domang, and I'm the Financial Literacy Program Coordinator at Ag Atwater Library. Uh, the Financial Literacy Program is made possible through a grant from Canadian Heritage. Today, I'm here in conversation with two of our regular presenters, Anne Soden. Hi, Anne. Hello. A lawyer and mediator. How are you doing today? I'm just fine. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. And also notary Anna Camateros. Hi. Hi. Nice to be here. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah. So Anna and Anna were originally scheduled uh, to do a presentation on wills, planning, and drafting, and avoiding challenges for our financial literacy literacy program at Atwater Library in our auditorium. So for obvious reasons, of course, that's been canceled. But we hope to reschedule in the not too distant future. Today, Anna and Anna will be sharing some helpful information about wills as it relates to the current situation that we find ourselves in right now. Uh, and in particular, what alternatives are available for people who wish to do their wills uh, during this crisis and how to avoid problems. So let's start with that, Anna, uh, because we've had a couple of requests uh, at the library for this information. And um, what are the alternatives that people have right now during this crisis? So we've discussed this in the past that there's different forms of wills that exist. So the gold standard to a certain extent is a notarial will because it's not subject to probate when someone passes away. So that just means that there's no proceeding that needs to happen. The will is automatically enforced when someone passes away. Um, so there's that. Then we have what we call a will done before witnesses, which can be done by computer but before two witnesses. So initialed on each page with the witnesses and then signed. Um, on the last page with the two witnesses again, and then with an affidavit attached to it. Um, and then we have what we call a holograph will, which the criteria there is that it be done completely handwritten, completely uh, written by the testator or the testatrix. Um, that's just a fancy way of saying the person, either the man or the woman, writing the will. Um, right now, with this whole new crisis that's happening, there's been a lot of people calling for wills, especially in mandates, um, especially people working in the field, um, people who are older, they just want to get their affairs in order because it's making us all think of our mortality and what we want to happen with our estates. Um, so one good thing is that usually a notarial will would need to be done in the presence of a notary and a witness. Ever since April 1st, because of the COVID crisis, um, in order to protect clients and to protect notaries, there's been a special legislation enacted which allows notaries to receive wills, any notarial deeds, by electronic means. So technically speaking, if you can assist this presentation, you have the means to do what we call an electronic uh, notarial deed, which could be a will. Um, it, it, it requires video conference, it requires certain technology, but it's doable and it's guided by the notary. So that's something that's new ever since April 1st. Um, so that's just a, the brief answer to your question, Natalie, to start. No, that's fine, because if someone wants to do a holographic will, mm -hmm. um, what, for those who wish to do their wills in holographic form, let me put it that mm -hmm. way, what uh, would be included? What would they need to include in that will? And yeah. consult an estate, a lawyer or a notary? Yeah, so my suggestion would be at this point in time with what we're living in, I don't see the will done before two witnesses as being an option. It would either be a notarial will or a holograph simple will that would be done with the assistance, at least drafted with the assistance of a notary or an estate lawyer um, as a stopgap measure, let's say, until this crisis is over. So the main things to include in a holograph will, and we can keep it simple. Um, so would be the choice of a liquidator, an estate liquidator. Uh, that's the person who's in charge of liquidating the estate. So paying off the debts when someone passes away, um, closing yeah. the accounts, selling properties if necessary, 
funneling the funds into an estate account, paying taxes, and then once all that is done, funneling everything that's left to the heirs or the heir. Um, a liquidator can be the same person as the heir. You can have several. Ideally, you would advise them in advance so that there wouldn't be any surprises when, and we'll, we'll funnel into that discussion later on as well. Um, and then it would be, who would be your heirs? And who do you want to receive your estate? I wouldn't suggest creating complex structures in a holograph will like trust. I, I would keep it very simple and clear cut. So I name such and such person as my estate liquidator, and I wish my estate to be shared amongst these people in equal shares. That's a simple holograph will. If that's also what you want, then you can do that right now as a stopgap measure, like I mentioned. However, and we're going to have this discussion as well moving forward, I wouldn't suggest doing anything drastic, especially okay. not graph will, because that's where we enter into a state litigation. So we'll get into that discussion later. Okay. And uh, I know that a common question that uh, you've told me that you've been asking, I've, I've heard this at the library too, is that uh, people ask, do they need to advise the executor um, or the mandatory in case of a probate mandate, protective mandate, sorry, uh, that they have appointed them as the executor or the mandatory. Yeah. So in terms of the will, like I mentioned, the executor, the liquidator is the most important person. Um, they have a big responsibility and also a big financial task. Let's say a lot of the times it's people who's good, who are good with finances, we appoint as liquidators or executives, depending on the, Quebec law says liquidator, but everywhere else it's known as executor. Um, so it's always best to have a discussion with the person you're going to be appointing um, or who you wish, whom you wish to appoint. Legally speaking, you're not required to do it, but in order to avoid your estate being left without a liquidator, if something should happen, you should ideally advise the person you wish to be the liquidator, make sure that he or she or they want to do it or are willing to do it. Okay. And also ideally advise them of the will you're doing, especially if it's a holograph will, you would need to give them a copy of this will so that they would have it and let this holograph will be known by your entourage that we don't end up in a situation where there might be litigation. So, my my definitely is my suggestion although legally it's not a requirement same thing with the mandatory or in the case of a protective mandate so the protective mandate is while we're still alive but deemed legally incapable to administer our finances and personal decisions and make personal decisions so the mandatory is the person that we're choosing to do that um it can't be done in holograph form, the mandate, though. So that's a separate issue. But again, definitely mandatory, no, because that's the person who's going to be making decisions for you while you're still alive, but legally deemed incapable. Um, so you want to make sure that you're on the same page. Yeah, and it's so important to, to let the people in your family know these things because, well, that really leads right into one of the things that I know uh, you wanted to talk about, and Soden. Um, the high cost of not talking, uh, which causes of estate litigation. So let's talk about that. What could, what, uh, what is the high cost of not talking? And uh, what are some causes, other causes of estate litigation? Well, as a lawyer specializing in elder law, in the field of elder law, I've dealt with a number of estate cases that are referred to me simply because the, either the content of the testator's will or his question of his or her capacity has been challenged by a family member or by a third party. Mm. And I have seen the horrors that family battles can inflict um, siblings and families torn apart irreparably, older parents manipulated for gain, and a succession, an estate absolutely decimated fighting over assets um, with only the lawyers and the accountants coming out with, with, the, uh, uh, with the 
sum total sometimes exceeding the sum total of the estate. Uh, the costs emotionally and financially are enormous. And so mm -hmm. we want to protect one's st estate and one's wishes in the best ways possible. And that is, of course, starting with someone such as Anna and notaries that we have, fine notaries, to do advanced life planning that includes wills and of course during our lifetime our protective mandates which can set out many many different matters that uh, that concern our health and our finances and um, ensure that we're going to be respected in all regards throughout throughout our lifetime um, our advanced medical directives which are a new feature that have come along and also, as Anna just mentioned, dialogue, open dialogue, communication with those who would step in to these representative capacities, but also the people who will be receiving from us and who will be part of our lives along the way. And it's for all ages. This is not just because I happen to be an elder law, that uh, although many people just finally get around to doing it late in life, but it really is for all ages. Many of our cases have been uh, that make the newspapers of young people who've had, who've died without wills or more importantly, those who have fallen sick with some very traumatic uh, condition, but have not named anyone at that point in their life. And so it's very important to be talking about these matters very early on. So the causes of estate litigation are multiple, and Anna can tell you as well, um, because certainly we want to try to resolve these matters or prevent these matters well in advance. And that is why going to a legal counsel such as a notary who will walk you through very carefully all of this planning period is so important. So the, the, they include the causes in capacity, was the person capable at the time? There are many challenges to capacity, particularly when a person is older, and if they do their will while they were sick or in hospital, which is not advised. There's the cases of undue influence, or we call in Quebec, captation. Hard to prove, but where the person has been coerced or manipulated, or the family feels that they've been coerced or manipulated by someone, often a new person who's entered into their lives or someone who has isolated them and taken care of them. Um, yeah. Where there's unequal treatment of beneficiaries under a will, that is a classic case for a fight, um, especially if it has not been discussed with the family in advance. And all of a sudden, one child is disinherited or there's an unequal percentage given to one over another. Extramarital uh, relationships, uh, a second union and a reconstituted family, a second family. How do you deal with all of these matters? It takes very careful, thoughtful planning in advance as well as discussion. Uh, third party beneficiaries, where someone such as your former university has been left a significant amount of money or the church and the beneficiaries are left with very little. Uh, spendthrift beneficiaries uh, who um, may have obtained money from a parent over time, and there's no recording of this money that has been given so that there is an unequal at the end of the day sharing. Special needs beneficiaries have to be very cared for. Somebody who has in a disabled child, adult child, you want to plan very carefully, uh, perhaps through a trust for these. Uh, family business issues are huge mm -hmm. if they haven't been properly planned for, where there's a, a number of brothers who've been involved in the business or the parent and the child, but there has been no uh, commercial uh, document that's been set up, a succession document that's been set up for these family issues. And then there's the challenge of the liquidator. And this for me comes up very often. And that is where the liquidator has, who has been named has not, as Anna said, been told about this, but has been named both as the mandatory 
and handling the money during the person's lifetime and is also the liquidator. Yeah. And there's a great deal of suspicion and jealousy that comes up in that regard when it's not known in advance and accepted by everyone in the family that this person acts in a very transparent and accountable way throughout the entire time that that person has acted. So the question of whether the mandatory and the liquidator should be the same person as it comes up, and that can cause a great deal of emotional reaction. So those are the causes. And then how do you prevent these uh, matters from, from happening? It is this very careful advanced planning that we do very well here in Quebec um, with notaries who are schooled and trained in this, but they bring in, for example, family business, tax experts in planning, um, people who are skilled in, in terms of um, other financial planning. It really has to be all put together. Your entire life planning has to be viewed in a, in a very, very comprehensive way, especially if you are going, if, if it's not just going to be simply you're leaving in equal parts to your children. Okay. And so um, my, my, certainly my solution is not only this very detailed advanced planning, but it's also communicating, having dialogue with the beneficiaries uh, that you are contemplating and the persons that you are going to be appointing. But before I get into that, because I've talked for too long, <laughs> I'd like Anna to, to, to weigh in on these family issues. Um, so I'm along, exactly along the same lines as Anne, basically. So it, it's really a matter of transparency. Even if legally speaking, there's no legal requirement to divulge the contents of someone's will or mandate, let's say in the case of a mandate. It's always best because this, the, the one thing I could say is the constant that I get from people coming for wills, especially, or any kind of estate planning or advanced life planning is I want my money to be dealt with accordingly. And I don't want lawyers to end up with my money. And yet we see more and more estate litigation happening, which I find is very sad, especially for people who've worked their entire lives to and really save their entire lives to have something to leave for their family as a legacy. Um, and then for this to end up in the state litigation. So again, just to reiterate, transparency is key. And just to go back to what I was talking about before, when it comes to, uh, when I, I say it with a lot of caution, this whole idea of doing a holograph will right now, um, it's really just as a stopgap measure that I'm saying that it could be possible. Um, so, and it would have to be done only in the simplest of cases. So an example would be, let's say someone who has no family and who wants to make sure that money isn't spent with private investigators trying to find family members all over the world or whatever the case may be, or that the government doesn't end up appropriating the estate, at least write out a holograph will of some kind stating which charitable organizations you would want to inherit from your estate and then make sure that this document is given to someone who you know at least so that it could be traced because there's no registration of holograph wills. So that's the best, the, the best example I could give you as to doing a holograph will right now as a stopgap measure or saying very, very simply, I wish for my, my estate to be divided equally amongst all my children. That's something that no one can refute at that point, because the law would say the same thing anyways. If you don't have a spouse, then everything gets divided equally amongst your children. Um, so the, the, other than that, I would really say if you want to do anything drastic, this inheriting a child as opposed to other children is something drastic. Um, it should be the, the right advice should be given. It should be discussed. And ideally, it should be divulged before someone passes away, because that's when we get into feelings, even if that child has been cut off from the family and is quote unquote, a difficult child. It's, it's not something that you want to surprise a close family member with when you pass away, when all those feelings uh, surface as well. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so Anne, uh, were, were there any other costs of estate litigation that you wanted to go through? Um, well, the costs alone, financially and emotionally, are so 
charged that it's to be avoided at, at all costs. And even if you are not, and, and Anna emphasized, you know, you're doing an unusual will or you have complex issues involved with it, it's so important to speak to your family because even in a harmonious family, I have seen cases, many cases, of people who get along just fine, and yet they all love absolutely uh, everything in the family home. <laughs> yeah. And you want to hear from your parents saying, look, we haven't itemized anything for anybody in this family, because we know that you as children are just going to get along just fine in terms of of, of sharing all of this in due course. Okay. That is such a wonderful statement for parents to make. I mean, it's a wonderful statement for parents to write to their children. That's the best legacy you can possibly give to them. <clears throat> and that should be part of advanced planning. Uh, so even where it's a, a, a very happy family, uh, such matters as the cottage. How do you deal with the cottage? Uh, does it do you leave it to all the four children or the three children and then what if two of them are living very far away and only one of them is really ever going to be using it and, and so discussing with your family they come with many interesting suggestions that, the, that may not have been thought of where you want for one reason to leave one child out because he's made a fortune in life and the other one has not been so fortunate in life and said to yourself, oh, he's going to understand my older son who is, who is now a millionaire. I'm going to be leaving it to, to my daughter who, who doesn't have money or doesn't have a home. But if you don't explain these matters, there can be sad consequences as well. The person who's been left out because he has plenty of money has children. And those grandchildren, in turn, have been essentially left out because nothing has gone to, to him or to his family. So these are things that are just very respectful communication with family. It's very important, of course, to also think of a couple of other matters that do come up. Um, when I say capacity is often challenged, it's very important if you are if you have any kind of, of problems or uncertainties with your family uh, and what you're planning to do with your, um, with your settling of your estate, meaning giving of your, uh, dividing of your property under the will, that you have your capacity uh, tested uh, so that there is something in the file to make sure that there will not be any kind of challenge to your capacity. Um, when you make your will and you put in a provision that might be out of the ordinary. So that is just a protective measure and most notaries will call for it as well saying you would be well off to do this, but many others don't. And so it is something that people should know. It's important as well that, that you uh, plan to do your will when you're in fine, fine form that you're not doing it at the last minute in a, when you're sick, because that certainly can raise uh, challenges. And that you, again, these documenting of gifts, because there is a great deal of jealousy and anger, and even cases taken where there is an accounting that is asked for, and a questioning of who got what in the past, and whether mom and dad were in a position to be making those gifts at the relevant time. So make sure that to, to your children that any important gifts and loans are documented so that they know in advance we want everyone to be treated equally ultimately. I can't tell you that the number of cases that I have of this nature that happen while the person is still alive, where there's questions of exploitation, somebody taking money or appropriating money because he feels entitled, he's been the caregiver. Uh, so those are the matters that really should be very carefully thought out. And so the family meetings are certainly highly recommended 
with a professional who is guiding and meeting, mediating the meeting or facilitating the meeting, and that they walk through all of these steps. Just as a parting remark, I was telling clients of mine that we've just settled a, an estate matter that went on for five years, very litigious, mm -hmm. that involved, involved them terribly emotionally, not financially, as it turned out, because our clinic helped them, but uh, in that particular case, because it was just a horrendous matter. But due to the fact that they had this very, very difficult time emotionally uh, over these past five years, they said, with your guidance and your constant repeating the importance of family meetings, because we're in a second union situation ourselves, this is a second marriage, we have met with our children and we have worked out everything on both sides of the family so that there is absolute acceptance by everybody in the family of what we've planned to do. And so that's, that is the best possible outcome. And that's so important right now, uh, com communication and connection. And it's probably actually one of the most challenging things to do right now. So I do thank you both. Uh, for communicating and connecting and sharing this information with our uh, library patrons and our viewing audience today. So in closing, um, I'd just like to tell you both thank you. And thank you. Um, do you have any other parting comments to make? No, it's been a pleasure being here. Yeah. Keep safe, keep well. Oh, thank you both so yeah. much. So um, for our viewing audience, uh, we are going to, if you have any questions, we're going to include both Anna Kamateros and Ann Soden's email, or you can simply, um, you can simply email me, Natalie, at atwaterlibrary.com. Oh, sorry, .ca. Here's all the information here on the screen. And I just want to tell everybody, thank you for watching. And thanks again to Atwater Library. And of course, thank you to Canadian Heritage uh, for making this possible through a grant. Stay tuned, stay in touch, and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.